The first one is Katie. She manages the IPMS USA project and directs dissemination and outreach at the Minnesota Population Center. She's also an economist researching family circumstances and labor market decisions, time spent with partners, and well-being over the life course, all questions that can be analyzed with MPC data. And then Catherine Fitch is the associate director of the Minnesota Population Center, has been working with IPMS and related census data infrastructure for more than 20 years. Um, as a historical de demographer, she is interested in family formation and measuring change over time. And IPMS makes that easy to do. <laughs> so, um, so we definitely, it's exciting to have two researchers who actually use the data that they're talking about today. And I uh, will hand it over to you. Uh, this is Kathy Fitch, and I'm here with my colleague. Hi, I'm Katie Genetic. Uh, thank you for so many of you to join us. We will start off with some, some overview material. We're at the Minnesota Population Center at the University of Minnesota. Just a little background about what we do here at MPC. Uh, first, we're, we're a university-wide interdisciplinary research center. Uh, so kind of what you might imagine as your standard interdisciplinary center, we're trying to bring together uh, folks on campus who study various population issues, and uh, we host a seminar series and we have other programs to connect people on campus. But uh, and then we are always uh, training uh, graduate students. We have a population studies training program and um, minor. But mostly, what you might, if you know, have heard of us, but how most people know the Minnesota Population Center is because of our data tools. We have been building uh, data access systems and creating harmonized data for um, more than 20 years. So I, I wasn't here at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> close. But, um, um, and uh, we are the home of IPMS and several other data projects. Now, just a note on that, that we say IPMS here. But out there in the world, you might have heard once someone say iPhones, and uh, Katie and I are totally okay with that. Um, if those iPhones, as long as you as people use the data and uh, cite us appropriately, we don't we don't care how you, what you say. This is the the web portal to all of our data sites. It's, you can reach it at iphones.org, and Katie is going to be walking through and giving you some background on these projects. Um, uh, after I give the broad overview. A lot of the data we provide are census and survey data, and we'll admit you can get them from other places. So kind of the question of like, why would you get data here that may, maybe you could get elsewhere? So we also have data you can't get elsewhere, but for things like the US Census, there's lots of places to get that information. It's publicly, you know, freely available online. The, the main thing we do is we standardize data across time and place. We want to make it easy for people to analyze more than one year, more than one, you know, one place for um, our international projects, uh, and do it easily. Uh, in addition to that, we add some uh, fields uh, in the data that um, are helpful to researchers, either in identifying uh, a lot of our data, our, our census and surveys of households. So we. We figure out uh, relationships between people in the household in useful formats. We have uh, some other uh, geographic fields that we help that are useful to researchers. Anyway, so it's not just what you get from the Census Bureau. There's some extras there. Uh, we also provide the data in multiple formats. And Katie's going to dig into this a little bit, how to, how to access our data. That's, there's a couple different ways to do it. Uh, we have excellent documentation that highlights uh, integration over time. So, uh, what you should know if you if you're gonna and we love to see this, you know, an, an analysis from 1900 to the present or some big broad sweep of time. Sometimes concepts have changed a little. So we're out there to help people understand how that might have um, might affect your analysis. And finally, we have um, excellent uh, uh, user support team that are there to answer questions by email or on our forum. So the start off of what we're, what we're aiming to do. Just to give you some background, since some of you, just to, uh, you know, who's out there using our data. 
Well, we were just at the economics meetings earlier in January, and those folks are our biggest group of users. Almost a third of our users identify as being economists, either uh, by training. Uh, demography and sociology is also a big group. Uh, GIS and geography. The, the history numbers surprise me, even though I'm a historian. Uh, and you, you can also see we have um, a you know good group of people in policy and the government using us. We have we have journalists, so um, uh, you can see our data uh, being used in uh, lots of cool online widgets. Uh, and then finally, as uh, you know, non-academics and private industry. But so we've got a pretty broad group. That, that sort of academic discipline here to give you another sense of how we think about it. We've got you know independent scholars, we've got graduate students, undergraduates, um, faculty members, people doing uh, local policy research, uh, uh, journalists, government employees. So uh, a few ideas of how people are using our data. Uh, as uh, I have I put in my bio, and Linda mentioned, um, you know I study uh, family transitions over time. So um, we and and that's what the data are made to to uh, be easy to do uh, over time and across places. Our international project has uh, we're disseminating is it now more than 90 countries. Yes, 92. 92 countries of data. Uh, you know, with coded similarly, so you can um, analyze all sorts of phenomena. You people use. Use it to study public policies. So you could have, you know, like a state level, uh, a state policy that goes into effect, and um, people can, you know, either look at the look at just that state, look at that state compared to other places. There's lots of ways to study public policy. People also grab our data to add contextual information to other survey data and to studies. And finally, we have a growing collection of uh, Boundary files for mapping, uh, so even more GIS analysis going on. A quick background about where where did we get IPOMs? Uh, the uh, I stands for integrated, consistent codes, uh, labels, and documentation. The public use it's uh, anonymized, downloadable data, and it's microdata, which means it's at the individual level. We've got a couple slides on talking about what it means that this is microdata. And the series it uh, means the data are pooled over time and place. And so I just want to talk about this uh, concept to start off with because the majority of our projects are microdata. So that means it's at the individual level. We capture individual survey responses for people in households, and we have all of those responses in one data set. So Instead of your fact finder, what is poverty in my census tract, you can look at building your own tables uh, and running multivariate analyses uh, from individual level data. I think we have a slide here that shows what it looks like. Here we go. So just looking at the record here, imagine each line is a person and we you know uh, this indicates here are the codes for the relationship to the householder the marital status variable, literacy, and occupation. And obviously there's lots of other information in there as well. But microdata are a little, so there, it it's, uh, can be more difficult to use than uh, something, than summary files where you're looking up information about places. But it gives you so much more flexibility. If you've ever been looking at a table and you've thought, oh, they made that break at just the wrong, I don't need that age group, I need a different age group. Or um, you don't like how the categories have been constructed. The microdata allows people to get at every bit of possible detail there is and you know construct your own occupation measures, for example. So the one trade-off that was on the last, I'll flip back here for a second, um, that we've de delved into. So the one problem to, to release this kind of data, there's a fair amount of geographic suppression uh, so that individuals can't be identified. So that means um, you're looking at places of always 100,000. Is that some counties are have 100,000? So you, there's some, you know, some counties you can identify with that but sometimes it's groups of counties and places. So that's a big um, yes 
I see your question here on tracked. Is that the last one? Yes. So uh, track level data from us. Um, and we're, we'll talk a little bit about NHGIS. We do offer that. Uh, but the, the, for the most part, the microdata, you, you have to be able to deal with bigger, bigger places than tracks. And that's the modern microdata. We oh, do have a lot of historical microdata where we can see where people live, sometimes even down to the address or uh, sort of like tracks. I mean, there aren't always tracks historically as well. We don't have maps yeah. for all of it yet. But, uh, but yes, yeah, so yeah. to be clear, there's a break in um, the, the, the U.S. data. Mm -hmm. uh, data that's been released by the Census Bureau, which is data from 1950 forward, has this geographic and other suppression they don't release. Uh, other, you know, very unusual um, codes that would make it easy to identify people. So that's the um, that's the the overview on uh, microdata. Now, there, Katie's going to go over. For the most part, we when we, well, I'll say this: when we started, the only way to access our data was to create a data extract, download it, and analyze it in a statistical software package. Uh, we now have ways to do online analysis with the SGA program. So those of you who are ICPSR um, users um, might already be familiar with the tool. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So that makes the data a little bit more accessible for folks who don't want to download and analyze them themselves. I turn it over and, and Katie will start off with our, um, our biggest project and uh, our oldest project. Yeah. Hello. So um, I'm going to walk through all of our microdata projects and let you know what's in the data, basically what the data covers. We figured since you, a lot of you are coming from a data librarian background that it would be really useful to know sort of what you can do, what is in this data. So when people come to you, you can show them, um, send them to a project that might be best fitting for them. Um, following the microdata projects, we'll talk a little bit more about aggregate data, and then hopefully we'll have time to um, actually go analyze some of this data online. Um, IPM USA is our uh, sort of longest standing data project. It's been around for more than 20 years, and we have U.S. decennial census microdata samples going back from 1850 all the way through 2000. So every 10 years, we have a sample of the population um, that's representative that you can do analysis on. There's one exception to that. Actually, 1850, 1890, sorry, is missing because the records were burned in a fire. Um, as Kathy mentioned, from 1940 and before, we had complete information on people because that data is public. So if any of you have gone to Ancestry.com and searched your family members, um, we've actually partnered with them. Uh, to create full count census microdata for research. And we've started that project, and we have complete count data for 1880 and 1940 available online. We've also created some linked sample data from 1850 through 1930 using that 1880 full count file. We have samples from Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico has a slightly different census than the rest of the U.S., and we make microdata samples for Puerto Rico available as well. And finally, we make the American Community Survey data available. So the American Community Survey replaced the long form of the decennial census starting in 2000. So now everyone, right, like a few years ago, got that teeny little census, and they were like, oh my gosh, there's nothing on here. Um, that's because it's possible that you've been surveyed with the long form, but via the American Community Survey. So this goes out to about 3% of the population each year. And the American Community Survey data comes out yearly. The microdata is a 1% sample each year, and it's our most used data set at the whole entire center. Uh, there's a question, which I will answer with my next slide. Because our upcoming USA data projects um, include all of the complete count data from 1860 through 1930. So we're continuing, you're correct, we're continuing to work with Ancestry. Um, they're helping us digitize the data, and then we get it ready for analysis for people. So uh, this year we'll be releasing 1850 full count, hopefully within the next month or two, and hopefully 1930 by the end of the year, and we'll slowly go back in time, or not that slowly, over the next five years. Uh, we also have, in collaboration with Ancestry, 
1790 through 1840 full count data set. It's a little bit different because the census back then was household data. So it was sort of like a tally, you can imagine, of um, like the number of white females living in your house and the, and the number of white males. And so it's a little bit different than the individual level microdata with the rest of the censuses, but we also will be making that data available. Actually, even maybe as exciting as these other projects are the um, work we've been doing with the Census Bureau on creating the 1965% sample. So we recovered some data with them, and uh, we currently have a 1% sample for 1960, but now we're going to have a 5% sample. And this sample is pretty special, too, because this is the only microdata sample where you can get down to geographies of 2,000 people. So um, that's pretty exciting. That'll be going live within the next few months. Uh, this brings me to IPM CPS, so this is the current population survey. Uh, somewhat related to the census data, it was administered starting in 1940, and it's the primary source of information of um, employment in the United States. So when you hear every month the jobs numbers, like if you're listening to NPR and they talk about the jobs numbers reports, this is where they're primarily coming from. It's a household survey that was designed for this purpose, to measure unemployment. And almost 60,000 households are being interviewed monthly. In addition to asking about employment and unemployment and basic demographics, each month almost they ask additional questions for other purposes. So this is at the bottom there when I'm saying additional supplements are given throughout the year. Uh, they ask lots of questions throughout the year to people. Um, and we are making all of this data available. So currently we have basic monthly surveys. That might even be wrong now. We maybe just released back to 76, but for sure 1989 through 2014. Um, we have all the ASEC data, or the annual social and economic supplement data. So this was previously known as the March demographic sample. It's uh, the most used data by social scientists from the CPS, and it goes back to 1962. It's actually slightly larger than the other monthly surveys because they ask it in a few months. And um, it asks a lot of questions related to work and demographics. In addition to the ASEC, we have other supplements we've been making available through the IPUMS. Uh, there's voter registration, fertility, the computer um, internet usage, and computer usage one is pretty interesting. Food security is really popular. Um, the tobacco use supplement is also used a lot by health scholars. So in this data, similar to the census data, that you can get down to state level identifiers, some metro areas, and some counties. Again, it has this sort of threshold of 100,000. Uh, the next project is IPOMS International. So this is the world's largest collection of publicly available individual level census data. So sort of like the US, how we have samples um, in different years of the census. We have census samples available from 82 countries around the world. And a lot of these countries have data going back to 1960 through the present. Um, we're actively working on new countries. I think we have agreements from over 100 countries to process their microdata. And we also archive it. So a big part of what we do is help countries clean and archive their historical data. So we are continuing to work with other countries. And we also have agreements with these countries to process their most recent round of data. So a lot of our data production across these 82 countries is getting the most recent census or the most recent data available from each country online for researchers to use the data. Um, I'm going to have an incomplete list here, I think. So this list, I think, is actually missing our new ones. And you can see, though, there's tons of countries. You can go online and see them all. This is a, a, a fascinating data source that not enough people are using. So you should send people in this direction, anyone that's really interested and doing international research. Oh, here's the map version. So the blue countries are the countries that we're currently disseminating our data, the green ones we're working on, and the gray ones, in some of those cases, we're still talking with them um, to try and work out uh, contracts to archive and disseminate their data. And in other countries, they actually don't have census microdata. Um, somewhat related to IPMS International is our North Atlantic Population Project. So this is sort of the historical version of Ephemes International going into the deep history, not 1960. Um, but there are actually 32 historical censuses from sort of um, in the northern Atlantic part of the globe. So Canada, Great Britain, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, and the US. Uh, we have data dating all the way back to the 1700s and all the way up through 1950. 
in this, uh, currently in NAP, there's um, complete count data for 14 censuses. And when it's complete, it will contain 130 million individual records. What we're really trying to do with this project is link people across time and countries over this period. So within countries and then across country migration using these complete count data sets and samples. This leads me sort of away from our census data to our survey data. So we have a number of US survey projects and international survey projects as well. Um, the first of which I'm going to talk about here is the integrated health interview series which is the National Health Interview Survey. This is a principal source of information on health in the U.S. population. It's been going on for a really long time, um, back since 1963 through the present. Households are surveyed each year. So this is not like the NHANES data, especially down in the south where you have all this data where people go sit in a van and weigh them and take their blood pressure. This is self-reported survey data where they're asked uh, many, many health questions, and it varies a little bit from year to year. There's about 45,000 households sampled per year. In total in this database, there's more than 13,000 variables. They ask loads of questions. They vary over time. Because this data is really, really sensitive, uh, the geographic identification in this data is only census region in the public data. And I'm talking like four regions of the country. You can't get state level data unless you go to the restricted data. Um, and you can bring our integrated data into the restricted data because this, the data we have, we've integrated it over time. So you can easily compare health um, information from 1963 through the present. The information on there, but it's uh, various health, many health questions related to individual level health. So one of our other survey projects is the American Time Use data. Uh, this is sort of related to the current population survey, uh, and it's funded by BLS and fielded by the Census Bureau. If you've been in the current population survey, which is actually a household panel, then you may be asked to be in the time use survey. This is a 24-hour time diary where respondents are called on the phone and they ask what they were doing, who they were with, and where they were over the past 24 hours down to the minute. Um, it's a pretty extensive survey. It takes a lot of time and energy to run, but it provides us with very uh, rich data on people's activities. And we also have information on the respondent and members of the household via the current population survey. So there's a lot of demographic information in there as well. Our international survey project is called the Integrated Demographic and Health Survey. So the demographic and health surveys have actually been around for quite some time. This is a partnership with Measure DHS and ICF International. They've been collecting this data for many years, um, which is really focused on women and children, and now they're partners as well, from over 90 poor to middle income countries. There's over 260 surveys total in the DHS, and we are in the process of integrating this data and making it available online to users. It covers a wide range of topics Again, really focused sort of on women and children, specifically family planning, health, domestic violence, um, a lot of focus on HIV and AIDS over the past few years, and healthcare in general. Our soon to be released project is IFLM's Higher Ed. This data should be released within the next two months. It contains data from CSTAT, which is the Scientist and Engineer Statistical Data System. So this is three surveys of U.S. residents with science and engineering degrees and occupations. This data is particularly hot now with a lot of interest in STEM fields and where people are going with them and gender equity in these fields. And this survey is an NSF survey, so a National Science Foundation, and it's given every two to three years. Um, it started back in 1993, and we have demographic information on people, education and work history, current employer characteristics, and their earnings. So this has been used a lot by education scholars, and we hope that by integrating this over time, it will make it easier to use for researchers. Uh, so those were all the microdata projects. And again, we sort of breezed through them all. There's a lot of them. All of the information on these microdata projects is available online. Uh, if you go to ipums.org, which we will go to here together, um, you can get to every single one of our data projects. We've been disseminating data online since the 1990s. We were one of the first sort of data producers to put our data online. And everything I've talked about here can be found online. So we really focus on documentation. And we hope that everything is documented well enough that you can go online or any student can go by themselves and get this data. 
So this brings me to my summary data project. So we just have two of these. And this is what summary data looks like. So this is an example. It's, uh, I pulled this table from FactFinder 1, actually. So it's a little bit dated here. But this is the total population of the US in 2000, broken down by sex and age. So FactFinder is sort of where we think of to get the typical aggregate data. So census tables that have been produced. And right, I have this here for the country, but you can go down to your census block or your tract and pull out different information that the census has created tables for. We also have summary data from the census via our NHGIS project. However, unlike FactFinder, which only has the last year or two available of data, we have the summary tables from the census going back to 1790 through 2010. We have every sort of table that they've made available online, and we've also created GIS boundary files for the geographies when we have been able to throughout time. This is a big wealth of data that more and more people are using. We also have ACS data, and we also make the blocks, and the, I think block groups or blocks available, which you can't get from FactFinder for ACS data. And I've heard about other people doing kind of wild things to try and go get that data, and it's really easy to go get it from NHGIS. One of the crowning achievements of NHGIS, too, is that we've created these time series tables. And as many of you probably know, when you try and use aggregate data over time, it can be really difficult because they change uh, how they group either geographies or they group sort of income chunks or age groups. And what we've done is really tried to reconcile these changes over time to create time series tables that you can compare so you can easily look from 1970 to the present over time at some of the published tables. So I encourage you, if you use this data, or if you know people that are trying to use aggregate data over time, to head to NHGIS. Uh, so, and I keep calling this a summary data project, but our, one of our newest projects is actually a summary and microdata project combined, and it's called TerraPop. Uh, the goal of TerraPop is to preserve, integrate, and disseminate global scale spatial temporal data. So we have microdata in it, and we have aggregate data. But we also have government land use statistics, we have land cover data from satellite imagery, and we have climate data, so temperature, precipitation, and cloud cover. So this is from around the world. We have uh, a lot of data from the US in this too, but we, again, we're using all of this data we have from around the world to merge land use uh, and land cover and the climate data. So this is really an environmental GIS and people project. Uh, currently, I actually think this is all completely out of date, so uh, I apologize, but so this and more, this is a very much in progress project. So we have microdata, we have aggregate data for all of these countries, we have GIS boundary files, I think for more than six countries now, and we have raster data, or sort of this climate um, and land cover data across the globe for a number of years. So this is really exciting for people who are doing sort of mapping and environmental research. So those are all of our current data projects. We, um, we're currently disseminating those. As you can see, we're working extensively on all of them as we move forward. We also are starting new projects, so we're really trying just to integrate as much data as possible to make it interoperable to do data across sort of disciplines and surveys, et cetera. Um, so in addition to that integration, kind of one of our key components is our data extraction. As I mentioned, we've been disseminating data online for like 20 years now. Um, and what makes us kind of special is this data extraction. So the ACS data, obviously you can go get the microdata even just from the Census Bureau, but people come to us because it's so easy to use, primarily because of our data extraction tool. And what it does is allows users to create custom data files. So you can pick any samples you want, as many or as few, and any variables you want, as many or as few as you want. So this is huge, especially for students. Um, and even in a new, when you know space is cheap now, this data is pretty big. Microdata can get huge. We have, I mean, these 100% data files are crazy. They're even hard for me to run on the server here. But if you want to look at 100% of the population but only look at children, our system allows you to do that. So you can just look at that one year, look at children, and look at just the variables you want. It makes it much more manageable. And this has allowed us to get these data in the hands of many more people than otherwise would have been able to use them. 
in addition to being able to sort of create this custom data file, our system creates a custom syntax file for you to read the data into a statistical package, into SPSS data, SAS, and it creates a CSV so you can read it into R or even look at it in Excel. Um, all of the data is labeled within it. All of the values are labeled. And there's a code book available that's custom to the data set you've created. There's also a record of this extract on your account. So when you make a data extract, you uh, it gets created on our system fairly quickly, sometimes within a couple minutes, sometimes within a half hour. And you get an email that is ready. You then go download it onto your own computer. And it'll sit online for about three to five days. After that, the data is no longer available. But you can always just resubmit that data. I have actually gone back and resubmitted data extracts from 2003. So it has exactly what I put on it. And I can just go get those data, those variables, and samples immediately. Um, as I mentioned, there's some pretty great features with this for usage. One of them is the case selection feature. So if you're only interested in looking at women or uh, elderly people, you can easily create sort of a subset of the large data sets for download. We also allow people to attach variables within the household from other household members. This is a little complex to explain, but basically anyone doing family level or household level research finds this immensely useful. You can also use a custom, our custom sample size. So if you, if this is really too big, we will pull a random sample for you and reweight the data within the extract system. Finally, all of our data sets are really similar. And we've done that for our own purposes to make it easy to process all this data, but also for users. So if you know how to create a CPS or a USA data set, then you can go over and start using IHIS really easily. Um, and this is just a nice thing for our users because how all of them operate is nearly identical. As Kathy mentioned, in addition to being able to look at this data within your statistical package, we can actually look at, analyze the data right online. Um, we did not create this system for doing this. This actually was created by developers at UC Berkeley. And it basically harnesses the internet to crunch this microdata. You can even look at multiple years of data online. And I'm going to demo it here so you can just see us go through it because it's pretty cool. Um, and there are help guides on the web page as well. And we have online tutorials to train you on it. This is a really great way if you just want to look at something quickly or you want to investigate something before you actually dig in to the data. Um, so I have two examples here. Uh, it's already 11.40, and I want to give time for questions, too. So I might go to the second one because it's a little more fun. So I did a little Googling since we uh, are working out of North Carolina here. Um, at least that's uh, where Linda was from. And it turns out Greensboro uh, lands, if you do some searching, in like the top 25 bikeable cities. Uh, so I decided maybe we should use the census microdata to see how many people actually bike commute in 2014. Uh, so let's just say you were curious about this. You saw this like you heard it on the radio, and you were like, wait a second. Do people actually bike to work? No one in my office does. Or if you work in an office like mine, it's like half the people bike to work. Is this remotely normal? Um, so what we're going to do here, what I'm going to walk through, I haven't looked at this at all. I actually have no idea. We're going to go check it out. I have no idea. I haven't done this. So I am doing this basically live just like you are. So this is what I would do if I wanted to see if people really are biking to work in Greensboro. And we could actually maybe compare it to somewhere else. Um, there's a couple questions right away we need to ask ourselves. Can we even identify respondents in Greensboro? Remember Kathy mentioned too this 100,000 limit? This is really tough. Like, Partly because sometimes these areas, which maybe you guys know about Pumas, these public use microdata areas, they don't always align with cities or counties. So even if there are 100,000 people in your city, you maybe can't identify them in the data. So we have to figure out if we can identify Greensboro. Then we need to figure out what information there even is on commuting in 2014. Can I actually look at this using this data? And who gets asked this question? This is just important for our analysis. Um, often in these surveys, there are whole sets of questions that don't go to people. Um, we don't ask 12-year-olds how much money they make. So how do we identify them in the data? All right, so I went directly to the IPOMS USA homepage. You can see this is located at usa.ipoms.org. Now there are sort of two key things. This website uh, is being updated as we speak. So um, however, we sort of like this throwback 1990s style. Uh, so the two big things you're going to do are under this data link. 
on the left, and you can sort of see my bleeping cursor over them. So this browse and select data is important, and then two down, this analyze data online. So I'm going to start with browsing and selecting data. I'm going to open it in a new tab, though, so we can keep this open. So I've clicked browse and select data, and I get this somewhat cryptic looking select variable start here. Uh, this is a way for you, we are actually in the extract system if you wanted to make a data extract, but this is also where all of our metadata lives. There's so much information about our samples and variables here. I know we're just interested in 2014, that was my question, so I'm actually going to start with select samples because I'm just going to look at the 2014 ACS data. So this is the American Community Survey data. All of these, this is a link, so I can go to the ACS and learn more about it. Um, but for now, we're just going to check it out. So I'm going to submit my sample selection so that now I only get ACS data. So my first question was whether or not I could identify Greensboro. And the variables are broken down into household and person variables, and you can see uh, the drop-down menu here about sort of where these type of categories the variables fit in. Obviously, for me here, I'm interested in a geographic variable because I want to see, look at Greensboro. So I pull down geography there, and there is this metropolitan area 2013 OMB delineation. So this is what I'm going to go check out. So here I am. This is where what we call the variable description um, area. So you can see here I have tabs across the top, which gives me a description of this variable, which is kind of long. There's a lot of information. There's a codes page. Um, there's also even a case count view. So I can see what codes are available in the 2014 ACS. I can also see how many people in the sample are in each of these areas. So I'm going to turn that on right now. There's also some other information here. There's questionnaire text. There's what samples it's available in. There's the universe. As I mentioned, some questions are not asked of everyone. Every household is asked where they, well, we know where it is because that's what it's sampled on. Um, and any comparability issues we have found in using this variable over time. But what's really important for me here is this codes page, because this is a metropolitan area, and I am looking for Greensboro. So I'm going to look for it. Here we are, Greensboro, 24660. And you can see there's about 3,600 people in the sample. So I think this seems like a pretty decent sample size to you to be checking on uh, if this is a really bikeable city. All right, so now that I've gotten the, we can identify Greensboro with this MET 2013, so this is a metropolitan area for Greensboro, I'm going to go back um, to my drop-down menus and look into this commuting variable. So obviously I know that I can do this with the ACS, and part of the reason I'm doing this, uh, this question in particular is because I think this transportation information in the ACS is fascinating. Uh, it seems a little obscure, except for that the transportation policymakers use this data extensively. So uh, urban planners, the transportation people, I've given a number of talks to them. They all use this place of work and travel time information um, all the time in their city planning. So you can see here there's a couple different variables they've asked. Um, Means of transportation to work, if you carpool, your travel time, time of departure for work, and time of arrival at work. We're going to check out that tran work variable. Um, you can see we're back at the variable description for this. Uh, tran work is the respondent's primary means of transportation. We can handle that. Uh, here are the codes. So I click the codes page. So here are the codes. So we can see I'm interested in biking. So that's 40. So it's a TRAN work code of 40. I mentioned that we were going to check the universe. So the universe in the ACS is persons age 16 plus who worked last week. So this universe thing, that means everyone under the age of 16 who is not working last week did not get asked this question. 
I'm going to go back to the codes and I see an NA code is 00. zero. So everyone in that group is getting a 00. zero. Just something to keep in mind when we're looking at this. Uh, and finally, just for fun, we'll look at the questionnaire text. Uh, how did this person usually get to work last week? So this is exactly what was asked in the 2014 ACS. This is really useful for people when you're looking at things over time to see how the actual question changed. So I'm back at the IFOs USA homepage here on my other important link, which is Analyze Data Online. So you can see my little cursor. On the left panel, under the data square, is over it. And I'm going to select it, and we're going to go to a whole new page. So bear with me. I'm going to click it. Oh my gosh, I lied. I have to do one more click. <laughs> so then we get to this. There's some information on analyzing data online. You can see there's an instructions, video tutorials. I'm going down to the 2014 ACS. Uh, this authentication is your registration information. To use this data, it is free. All of our data is free of charge, but you do have to register to use it. And once I log in, here is what it looks like. Also kind of a throwback to the 1990s, but it's super powerful. So I'm just going to show you this so we can see the data. If you are more interested in using this, obviously we have video tutorials, help guides, and user support that you can email, which we will touch base here on a bit. So I am going to, I know what I want to do. I still don't know what it's going to look like. But I'm going to look at this variable, tran work. And I am going to use some selection filters here. So I'm going to ignore everyone that's not in the universe. So I'm going to ignore all those zeros. I didn't even remember. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to look at just Greensboro, which is 26600. Um, and then I'm going to apply this person weight. So as I mentioned, all of the census data are samples. They're nationally representative. However, due to sampling and over and under count, it's not, they're not all flat samples. So even though it's a 1% sample, not every person in the sample is equivalent to 100 people in the population. The Census Bureau or the National Statistical Office generally provides weights, um, so it can account for underrepresentation, overrepresentation. Um, oftentimes in the census, they oversample rural areas because not as many people live there anymore, but they still have a lot of policy and important things that we need to be aware of. So the weight accounts for that and will make this nationally representative. And at least this case representative to the Greensboro area. So I'm going to run the table. 0.1% of the population <laughs> gets to work on a bicycle. Uh, 398 is the estimate for all of Greensboro, which is estimated to be about 350,000 people in 2014. 3.9% um, are working from home. The majority of people get there by auto, truck, or van. Look at those walking numbers, huh? Walking only. That's pretty good. Um, we should, what I'm going to do now, I am going to take off the weight once, so I'm going to go with none, so we can just see in this sample. This is kind of important when we're looking at these smaller areas, so what we're making these claims on. So two people in the sample, then motorcycle, three taxi cab, five bikes, 16 walks, or wait, 67 walks, that's very good. One person said they wrote a fairy book. So there was just a little preview of something you can do with our system. Um, obviously, this is just an overview. So I am going to try and unshare and go, oh, maybe I do this. I just sort of wanted to wrap up here. We'll have a, like five minutes for questions here. But we do have a YouTube channel with many tutorials about how to go through our extract system, how to analyze data online how you can um, utilize our system to do a lot of different things. Uh, we also have online trainings. So there's training materials at this ridiculously long website. And these are, there's online modules that you can walk through the data, or you can, um, there's like exercises you can print out to learn how to use our data within Excel, SAS, SPSS data, um, and our online analysis. So, Encourage people to go that direction or send people this direction to utilize these. And finally, 
we have a user support team that answers user questions around the clock. It's personalized uh, help. Definitely um, within like 24 to 48 hours, you will get an email back, and they're incredibly helpful. They will help you if you just can't figure out the website, to if you think you found an error in the data. If you find an error in the data, we actually send users mugs. So we want to hear about anything you discover in the data to try and make it better. So with that, um, I'll open it up for questions, but then also if you have any questions you'd like to ask more in-depthly, you're welcome to email Kathy or I or email the IPMS line. Yes, so you can, the best way to do it is just to register for one of the data sets. You can also email if you don't want to do that, but if you register for IPMS USA, you will be on the email list and we'll send you any updates about when the data is becoming available or once it becomes available. Yes, you can use R. So we don't make right now um, like a, a program file to read our fixed with files into R um, in part because our data is a little hard to use R on a computer like a personal PC. It tends to crash them. Um, R doesn't handle long data sets very well. However, if you have someone that's using it on the server, um, you can easily do that. And you can take our CSV file, and we will help you with that. Or you can do the STATA file and do it. Um, the other thing is there's, uh, some, there's some pretty cool new things out there. I will type it in. Uh, um, uh, there's a great tutorial ball, uh, from Monet DB that's about um, taking like the large IPMS international data and making it possible to use it on R. It might even be Monet Dot. Uh, so here are the YouTube tutorials. And these are on all of our websites. If you go to the help section on our website, there's a link to our tutorials. Thanks so much. I don't really know how much um, folks like you do to uh, direct people to resources like ours. So, um, yeah, feedback is always welcome. If you know, if you have a student, or you know, you, you send someone to us and you feel like they they don't get what they need, you know, please contact us. Let us know what we can do better.